In our discussion of last week, we saw why rationality is the foremost virtue of a code of ethics which holds man's life as its standard. Why, since man's basic tool of survival is his mind, is his reason, since his life and well-being depend upon perceiving and identifying the facts of reality correctly and of acting accordingly, thinking is the basic virtue that man can practice, the virtue at the root of any other virtue. And conversely, his cardinal and basic vice is evasion, blanking out the willful suspension of consciousness, the refusal to see or to judge or to know. Now then, this evening I shall proceed to a discussion of some of the other virtues, the other basic principles of action required by a morality of life. I shall be concerned to elaborate the meaning of these principles of action and to show how they relate to the matter of survival. And the first of the virtues I shall discuss in this connection is the virtue of independence. Let me begin by quoting a brief paragraph from Galt's speech. Quote, Independence is the recognition of the fact that yours is the responsibility of judgment and nothing can help you escape it. That no substitute can do your thinking as no pinch hitter can live your life. That the vilest form of self-abasement and self-destruction is the subordination of your mind to the mind of another, the acceptance of an authority over your brain, the acceptance of his assertions as facts, his say-so as truth, his edicts as middleman between your consciousness and your existence." Close quote. Strictly speaking, if one understands why rationality is man's cardinal virtue, it is something of a redundancy to add that man should be independent. That is, it is a redundancy to state that man should reason independently, since to reason dependently would be a contradiction in terms. Either man reasons or he doesn't reason. Either he is concerned with the correct cognition of reality or he is not. Either he seeks authentically to know and to understand or he does not. In a word, either he thinks or he does not. A default on the virtue of independence can only be a default on the act of thinking and judging. The independent man is the man who assumes the responsibility of judging, of passing judgment on what is true or false, right or wrong. Feelings, wishes, hopes, evasions are not substitutes for judgment. When they are treated as tools of cognition, then they represent the attempt to escape rational judgment. There are no independent feelings or independent evasions. To substitute an emotion or an evasion for a thought is to renounce one's independence. It's important to stress this in every possible way because some people have the totally fallacious notion that independence means acting on your, quote, own feelings, close quote. It means nothing of the kind. The man who blanks out, who doesn't exercise rational judgment, 
and who is run by his feelings has to, a good deal of the time, function as a parasite on the thinking of others because no person is so blind as to literally believe that he can deal in reality guided only by his feelings. So that if he doesn't choose to accept the responsibility of thinking, a good deal of the time he is riding on the thinking or on the mistakes of others. He is an intellectual dependent. The intellectual dependent is the man who asks not what is true, but rather what do others think is true? What do others say is true? And making his mind subservient to the minds of others, accepts their pronouncements, their assertions, their say-so on faith. That is, without an act of independent critical judgment. If a man accepts an idea which he did not originate because he has understood it and by his own rational judgment is convinced that it is true, this does not make him a dependent. This does not make him a parasite. The fact that you learn from other men and are not the originator of every idea you hold does certainly not make you a dependent. One of the attributes that distinguishes man from the animals is precisely his power to transmit knowledge so that the intellectual achievements of the past do not die with the men of the past. Necessarily, we all gain a great part of our intellectual possessions, so to speak, from other men. But there is a very real sense in which each man, if he is to be independent, must face existence as if he were alone, as if he were the first and only man on earth. Whether a new idea is the product of his own mind or of the mind of another man, he must consider that idea as if no mind had ever considered it before, as if no one had ever said it's true or it's false, as if he is alone to grasp it, to judge it, and to decide its truth or falsehood validity or invalidity. The ideas of others can properly be used only as the material for one's thought, as that about which one thinks, among other things. But the evaluations of other men must not be a substitute for one's own evaluation for one's own judgment. The independent man accepts as true those ideas and only those ideas which he has understood, which his own mind has grasped and judged as true. He accepts only that which makes first-hand sense to him. Now, here again, a certain aside is necessary. I say that an independent man accepts only that which makes sense to him. This doesn't mean that if you hear an argument which in fact is irrefutable you are spared the necessity of ever committing yourself one way or the other by simply saying, well, uh, this doesn't make sense to me. I'm not convinced. You haven't persuaded me. If a person gives you an argument, and if you're not persuaded, or if there's something you don't understand, you have to know what and why. 
You may want time to think it over if you can't immediately say why you don't agree with it. But you cannot permit yourself forever to evade the responsibility of passing judgments by simply saying, well, uh, I don't know, I'm not convinced, period. Before a man accepts any idea, he must identify and grasp those facts and concepts from which the idea is derived. That is, he should be able to prove the idea. To do less is to take the idea on faith. The dependent man absorbs and retains only the conclusions of another's thinking, not the reasons which validate those conclusions. The mark of the independent man is that he grasps not merely conclusions, but conclusions and their proofs as well. If a man simply memorizes conclusions which he doesn't authentically understand, he will not know how to use those ideas productively or creatively. He may be able to repeat them by rote, he may be able to sling formulae, he will not know how to think with the ideas if he doesn't understand the concepts that validate them, the facts of reality from which they were derived. And in this connection, I am reminded of a man I knew some years ago who uh, was studying objectivism. This was before the founding of NBI. And I noticed that while he was a quite intelligent person, he showed remarkably little ability, puzzlingly little ability, at the art of thinking creatively or productively with objectivist ideas. And in the course of a conversation one day, I learned that he, in effect, was functioning on the following kind of policy. Once upon a time, either Ayn Rand or Nathaniel Brandon had discussed various aspects of the philosophy with him. He had asked them questions, he had heard their arguments and their reasoning, and at the time he was satisfied that their reasoning was valid and made sense. Having satisfied himself that the reasoning was valid, he decided that it was now necessary only that he retain the conclusions of the discussion, secure in the knowledge that the proof was, after all, safely in reality, locked up, so to speak, or deposited inside the vault of Miss Rand's and Mr. Brandon's head, like a filing cabinet where you keep records that you don't want to clutter up your desk with. Well, you cannot treat ideas that way and expect them to do you much good. You cannot delegate to somebody else the job of knowing the proofs of your convictions. You see, the more obvious kind of mistake is the person who simply accepts something on faith from the beginning because it feels right or it emotionally appeals to him. But the subtler form of error is the person who exercises judgment when he is first hearing the case. He doesn't accept it on faith originally, but once he's satisfied that the arguments make sense, he then proceeds to forget them. He knows they're there. He can always get them out of his files. That is, pick up the telephone and ask Rand or Brandon. He knows the answers exist. He's seen them. So now all he needs is the conclusions. But that's not true. If you want to think productively with ideas, you have to know their proofs, you have to know how one concept relates to another, how they are derived, how they are structurally organized. Otherwise, it isn't knowledge that you possess. A man is safer when he makes an error through his own judgment 
than when he blindly and uncritically accepts the correct judgment of others. If he does judge, does think, but makes an honest mistake, then he may have to pay the consequences of his error in action, but he still has retained the means, the method, of correcting his error and arriving at truth. But the dependent is not only unable to apply his memorized formulae successfully in any situation which is the least bit subtle, he is pursuing a course that renders him unable to distinguish truth from falsehood. A common fallacy concerning the actual nature of independence is often expressed in some such statement as this. No one can be fully independent because we all have to rely on experts in fields of knowledge outside our own. If you are sick and the doctor tells you that you need an operation, don't you have to take his word for it? Let's consider the confusion and the fallacy involved here. A man, to begin with, does not have to be omniscient or a universal scholar in order to know what he is doing. He needs only to know very clearly what are his grounds for any given decision and that they are sufficient and rational. We all must, at times, make decisions without full knowledge, act without full certainty. We must all take the calculated risk of trusting the competence of a specialist in some field of endeavor. But a calculated risk is rationally justified only if it is a calculated risk and not a blind leap in the dark. It is not, for example, it is not a rationally calculated risk to walk into the office of the first doctor who shingle one happens to see, knowing nothing about the man's qualifications or past record, and then agree to have him take out the appendix one could have sworn was removed years ago. Rationality and independence require, when one is dealing with an expert, that one have a first-hand reason for confidence in the competence of that expert. It requires further that one never cease to judge what the expert is saying and doing. If, for instance, your doctor prescribes a medicine that makes you progressively more and more ill, you do not continue to go to him on the grounds that since he is an expert, he must know what he is doing, despite the fact that you were healthier before he began treating you. <coughs> you don't or shouldn't suspend judgment merely because you go to someone seeking services in a field where presumably he knows more than you do. I can think of a personal example where several years ago I was having some trouble with my eyes, and I went to a very highly recommended ophthalmologist, and he gave an explanation of what the problem was. Only I tried to follow his advice, and something about it didn't make sense. I didn't have a great deal of confidence in him, in spite of the recommendations I had heard. And I went to a different ophthalmologist just to check up and got quite a different interpretation of what the problem was, which proved to be correct because the problem was resolved immediately. Another example familiar to many of us who drive cars is the following. Suppose that something is wrong with the car and you're not a mechanic. I don't think anybody on earth knows less about automobiles than I do. Not very many people anyway. And uh, peculiar noises come from the car and you have to take it in for a checkup. 
Well, now, if you go to a garage station, every time you wander in there, you're informed that something incredible <laughs> is wrong. You get suspicious, don't you? And you think, mm, perhaps uh, this uh, garage operator is uh, being less than altogether candid in his diagnosis. So you shop around until you find the station who, by their general manner of dealing with you, gives you the impression that they are reliable and don't invent imaginary troubles. But even then, even then, and this is a very important point, even if I decide to take the mechanic's word for it, which I may do, deciding I have reason to do so, that doesn't mean that I know he is right. If, for example, there is some weird or unpleasant noise or unpleasant odor coming from my car, and he tells me that it's such and such, and I say, fine, go fix it up, and I come back the next day to get the car and the trouble is gone, that doesn't mean I know for a fact that the trouble was what he said it was. Conceivably, he could have erred too, or didn't tell me the truth. The point is that there are times when we have to act knowing that we don't know for sure, but knowing that there are grounds to warrant us taking the action anyway. And such decisions are forced upon us all of the time. We don't always act with full knowledge. A great deal of the time we act with far less than full knowledge. But we do have to know what we know. We have to know why we are doing what we are doing. And if we are taking a calculated risk, we have to know why we consider it justifiable to do so. But you cannot accept an idea as true you cannot accept it as your knowledge unless you know why it is true. Thus, you may be willing to accept the statements of a doctor as probably true if you have first-hand knowledge of his reliability. You may be willing, justifiably willing, to act on his advice. But if you do not know medicine, you do not literally know that his statements are true. You must always, therefore, distinguish between that which you actually know and that which you have reason, good reason perhaps, to assume is true and are willing to act on, but which you do not literally and actually know to be true. There is one field in which every one of you must in a crucial sense, be an expert, and that is the field of philosophy. I do not mean by this that each of you must be a professional academic philosopher. I do not mean that you have to involve yourself with the more technical aspects of philosophy, if that's not your interest. I mean that on the broader, more fundamental level, everyone does have a philosophy of life, and he should know firsthand why he believes what he believes. He must have reasons for his convictions. He should know the basis of his own premises. He cannot act and live his life on the advice of a professional philosopher in the same sense that, in a limited sense, he can take the advice of a doctor. The reason for this is that philosophy, and particularly morality, involve and dominate every aspect of human existence. It isn't a specialty like medicine. Moreover, the facts with which a philosopher deals are equally available to everyone. They're not the specialized kind of facts that a scientist deals with. An individual can learn from a professional philosopher, but he cannot say, as he might say about a doctor, since the philosopher appears competent, I'll take his word for it, I'll live according to his principles, I don't have time to think about those questions on my own. You cannot leave to anyone else the job of running your life you have to know the reasons for the ideas by which you live. 
Now, the primary meaning of independence as a virtue is a psychoepistemological meaning, as you can see. It pertains to the action and function of your consciousness. It pertains to how your consciousness functions, to the issue of whether or not you seek to know for yourself or blindly follow the authority of others, whether you judge or unthinkingly agree, submit, and obey. It's a psychoepistemological issue. But there are certain related senses in which it is relevant to talk about the virtue of independence, which have relevance in an ethical discussion. You will sometimes see an extremely irrational statement to the following effect. It's nonsense to talk about independence. No one is independent. Everyone depends on everyone else. Aren't you dependent on the grocer from whom you buy your bread and meat? Well, here, of course, it is economic independence that is being discussed. The purpose of such an argument is to make you lose the concept of the difference between a relationship of trade among men who exchange value equivalents and the relationship of parasitism where one man gets an unearned support from another. If you pay the grocer for what you get, your relationship is one of independent equals. Independence does not require that you live on the self-sustaining farm. In the material or economic sphere, it merely requires that you produce the value equivalent of what you consume. Now, there is one other aspect worth commenting on, and that is the issue of your moral independence of the actions of other men. No one's actions but your own can ever constitute a moral reflection on you. Very often, unfortunately, a person will, mistakenly, feel morally guilty for some irrationality or immorality committed by some other member of his family. But there can be no moral responsibility where there is no freedom of choice. And the only actions over which you have the power of choice are, of course, your own. You cannot be guilty because of anyone else's immoral actions unless you sanction those immoral actions. And then what you are guilty of is not the other person's actions, but your own action, that of sanctioning his actions. There is no way for a man to possess self-esteem, no way to hold the inner certainty of his competence to deal with reality if he does not practice the virtue of independence, if he does not assume the responsibility of independent judgment for the very simple reason that a man cannot be convinced of the efficacy or the competence or the rightness of his mind and of its method of functioning if his characteristic method is to suspend his mind in blind obedience or agreement to the assertions of others. Now let us turn to another cardinal virtue of the objectivist ethics, that of integrity. If rationality and independence demand that you think, the virtue of integrity demands that you remain loyal to your thinking in action, which means it demands that you not betray the judgment of your own mind. To practice integrity means to be integrated, to allow no split between theory and practice. 
no split between one's convictions and one's actions. Now, according to the conventional altruist view of morality, integrity is a virtue because, as they see it, it requires the sacrifice of one's self-interest to one's moral principles. This view, of course, rests on a prior premise, the premise that one's moral convictions have nothing to do with one's self-interest or with reality or with reason, and that one's practical self-interest would lie in acting contrary to one's moral convictions. It rests on the premise that the good in theory is the destructive in practice, that man's mind and body are two warring elements, that his spirit requires that which would make his physical survival and well-being impossible. It assumes a split between the moral and the practical. But if reason, not faith, is the standard by which one forms one's concepts of good and evil, then there is no split between theory and practice, between the moral and the practical. The rational and the moral is that which serves man's self-interest and to survival and well-being on earth, serves it objectively and in fact. If one's convictions are rational, then integrity, meaning loyalty to one's judgment, to one's mind, to one's convictions, is a practical necessity of human survival. The meaning of integrity as applied to consciousness is confidence, the knowledge that the judgment of one's mind is valid. The meaning of integrity as applied to action is courage the knowledge that to act on the judgment of one's mind is practical. If life on earth is the standard, then, to quote Galt, quote, courage and confidence are practical necessities. Courage is the practical form of being true to existence, of being true to truth, and confidence is the practical form of being true to one's own consciousness, close quote. To remind you of a little story which Mrs. Brandon tells in her biographical study of Miss Rand in our book, Who is Ayn Rand? At the time when it was professionally dangerous to do so, Miss Rand, then working in Hollywood, was very outspoken in her public condemnation of communists in the movie industry. And there was a lot of pressure brought to bear, generally speaking, against people who spoke up in this manner on the part of the studios because they didn't want the bad publicity reflecting on Hollywood. When some of her conservative acquaintances complimented her on her courage, Miss Rand answered, I'm not brave enough to be a coward. I see the consequences too clearly. To sacrifice one's convictions to the wishes of other men is an act of self-renunciation and self-destruction, and that's both impractical and immoral. If, for example, you know that individualism and capitalism are good because they make human survival possible, but you pretend to be sympathetic to or tolerant of collectivism because it is popular, you betray your own consciousness, you betray your own judgment and support that which you know to be evil. You are not acting practically, you are paving the way for your own destruction and you will have deserved it. If you are an atheist who pretends to believe in God or perhaps to be only an agnostic because your relatives and friends are religious, if you betray your own judgment in order to cater to that which you know to be irrational, you will despise yourself and you will deserve it. If in your work you hold high standards which you betray in order to gain the approval of men whose judgment you don't respect, 
You will destroy any pleasure your work could give you. You will undercut and invalidate the motive that had made you choose your work. You will perceive every compliment and every success as a reproach and a source of guilt. And you will be right to. Integrity requires of men, among other things, that they assume responsibility for the consequences of their own chosen actions. And this, of course, implies the previous responsibility that when they act, they should be concerned to know what will be the consequences of their actions. To accept responsibility for your actions isn't a duty you owe to others, isn't something imposed on you from above, it's logically required by the principle of loyalty to your own values and to the principle that you don't attempt to defy the facts of reality or to go outside reality or to place your desires beyond the reach of reality. If you want a certain kind of career, then you have the moral responsibility to work to achieve it. If you choose to have children, then you have the moral responsibility to support and educate them. But there can be no unchosen duties and no duties which demand the sacrifice of your rational self-interest. The man who would protest that it is not to his self-interest to assume responsibility for the consequences of his actions is announcing that he intends to perform irrational actions, but that isn't to his self-interest. You see, and this is a very important point. Objectivism would never see integrity as some sort of self-sacrifice or resisting of temptation. But if a morality is placed in opposition to human nature and to life on earth, men will necessarily see integrity in terms of self-sacrifice and a struggle with temptation. They'll have to struggle against the sin of wanting to live and to be happy. A rational code of values teaches man that evil means pain and destruction, and that isn't a temptation. One of the simplest and yet most eloquent ways to understand the difference between our approach to this issue, our perspective, and the perspective of conventional morality, and an eloquent proof of the bankruptcy of conventional morality may be observed at any magazine stand. You all know the popularity of the brightly colored magazines with pictures of beautiful girls and promises of the forbidden pleasure well, very significantly and very typically, one such magazine is, or rather was, because I think it's now going out of business, called Satan. I don't think it's around anymore. Well, pause on the implications of this. Here you're offered a magazine with beautiful girls in it, some kind of humor or assumedly, presumably entertainment, a value, and it's called Satan. Well, imagine the following. If you walked into a store in Atlantis, do you think that you'd be offered this kind of a magazine furtively under the counter <laughs> entitled, entitled 
Wesley Mouch. Do you think that you would see something intended to be attractive to you, something offering you pleasure, excitement, glamour, romance, entitled Wesley Mouch? That's the difference between the conventional view of good and evil and ours. We'll take a break here for 10 minutes before continuing. <laughs> now to continue our discussion. The essence of independence is, my mind is the only judge of reality. The essence of integrity is, I hold the judgment of my mind above all else. The essence of honesty is, I do not sacrifice my mind's judgment of reality for the sake of an illusion in the minds of others. If rationality consists of the recognition that existence exists, Honesty consists of the recognition that only existence exists. That, quoting Galt, the unreal is unreal and can have no value. All acts of dishonesty, lying, cheating, fraud, are an attempt to obtain some value by means of faking reality to obtain some value which, in fact, one has not earned and cannot justifiably claim. This is obvious in the case of financial fraud, but many people who are honest in financial matters do not hold the same standard in spiritual or intellectual matters and do not hesitate to seek values by fraudulent means. Yet the principle is the same. If you gain love by faking your own character, by pretending to possess virtues which you do not possess, it is not you who are loved, but a fraudulent image which you have created in the mind of another person, and which in fact has no reality, no separate reality. If you gain fame, admiration, prestige for achievements which are not your own, like Peter Keating, or for faked achievements which do not exist at all, like a scientist who falsifies scientific data, or for achievements which you, by your own standards, do not regard as values, like any so-called box office chaser, in all such cases, the fame, admiration, or prestige are not real. They are merely an illusion, a false appraisal in the minds of other people. You wouldn't envy a paranoic with delusions of grandeur who imagines himself to be a great man. And yet the existence to which you condemn yourself if you seek values by fraud is, in a sense, more unreal than his. He, at least, enjoys his own first-hand delusion, if you can call it enjoyment, while what you get is only a public delusion, second-hand. And the more you attempt to enjoy it, the worse your inner torture of fear, guilt, self-loathing. You are a great man in all eyes but your own, and that faked greatness for you works as a constant reminder of your own mediocrity, impotence, unworthiness. This is the penalty for that abject self-abasement which is implicit in the formula of every liar. Only I will know. Identify what that means. Only my mind will know the time of fraud. And of what importance is my mind? Only my judgment will call me a scoundrel. And what do I care about my judgment? My own knowledge, judgment, perception, evaluation are the most negligible of all and the most dispensable. 
why should I consider the opinion of so insignificant a person as me? Is it any wonder that men who act on that formula are never able to achieve happiness, security, self-confidence, or self-esteem? Consider the monumental insult which a man pays to himself when he decides to fake his character or his actions in order to invoke a delusion in somebody else's consciousness and to live with the inner knowledge of what his own state is. If such a man then runs to a psychiatrist moaning that he has no sense of personal identity and that he can't stand his chronic feeling of dissociation from existence, well, what identity and what sense of reality did he expect to possess after a lifetime spent on faking both? Such is the fate of men who choose lies and fraud as their basic policy or dominant policy for dealing with existence. But the majority of men who don't go that far, who practice a kind of mixed economy of the spirit, being neither hopelessly dishonest nor fully honest, do not escape the same fate and the same penalty. It's merely a matter of degree. The small lies, the petty cheating, the shabby little deceits for insignificant gains, which most men practice and forget in the course of their lives, which they drop like mere counterfeit pennies, not dollars, along their road, are never really left behind. The merciless computer of their subconscious registers and adds them up. And these men stop one day, feeling inexplicably impoverished, wondering who has depreciated their spiritual currency, unable to recall the steps or the occasions, knowing only that their self-esteem feels worn, frayed, eaten through. The self-esteem destroying essence of dishonesty is that you place another person or persons higher than reality in your scale of values. It is hard to tell which is worse. To lie to men whom you consider your superiors in order to gain some faked virtue, or to lie to men whom you consider your inferiors in order to avoid trouble. This last is probably more prevalent and, in a sense, uglier. If you tell lies to your relatives or chance acquaintances whose opinion you do not respect, if you consider them stupid or unable to understand you and therefore you choose lying as an easier course, you have nothing to gain by it. Your actions are non-venal, which makes it worse for your self-esteem. You sell out too cheaply. You give up the reality of your own existence. You betray your values, surrender your convictions for the sake of people you despise. What does this imply about your estimate of yourself? The terrible contradiction that a liar has to live with is the fact that he becomes the slave of his victims and not the slave of their virtues, but of their weaknesses, vices, and flaws. Because in order to maintain his deceit, he has to count on their blindness, their unintelligence, their evasions, their irrationality, and he has to dread their perceptiveness, intelligence, reason. Thus he has to run from the virtues of others and to seek out their flaws. He has to value that which is a defect in others and fear that which is good. For instance, suppose a scientist becomes famous for some discovery which he claimed by falsifying scientific data. Thereafter, it is the best scientists whom he has to dread. He might enjoy discussions with the rank and file whom he can hope to fool, 
but an invitation to discuss his work with the best minds of his profession would throw him into an anxiety attack. If his ablest colleagues, whose recognition he had desperately wanted, show interest in him and seek him out, he has to try to avoid them. Any perceptive question from anyone, any sign of serious interest in his work, becomes a sign of danger. So he has to gravitate toward the more credulous, the less critical people around him, the less severe, the less demanding, the less conscientious, in order to be safe. He has to run from intelligence and honesty because now it's only their opposites with whom he can feel secure. Lying or fraud is existentially impractical and achieves the opposite of the liar's intended goal. And no man of self-esteem would subject himself to the humiliation of sacrificing his own truth and his own reality to the blindness of others. There are perhaps more misapprehensions about the virtue of honesty than about any other virtue. Honesty does not mean that you owe an answer to any idle or impertinent question anyone chooses to ask you. You do not owe information to those who have no right, purpose, or business to question you about matters which do not affect them. In such cases, honesty consists of refusing to answer, not of lying. In such cases, you may point out, if you care to, that their question is improper. But you don't lower yourself to the status of a liar for the sake of their impropriety. Nor does honesty demand that you become what may be called an aggressive truth-teller who volunteers his unsolicited, unflattering opinion to anyone on any subject, justifying himself in the name of honesty. We all know there is that type also. In situations which do not concern you, or in situations which were not created by your choice and action, but which are imposed on you by others, the moral alternative is not to tell the truth or to lie, but to tell the truth or nothing. This does not mean that one may keep silent in situations where one's silence implies a lie or a sanction of evil. For instance, you do not keep silent if you hear your values being attacked at a gathering where your silence may be construed as agreement. You do not have to argue if you do not consider the people worth enlightening, but you should state, as a minimum, I do not agree with you. One must always judge the full context of a situation and act in a manner which will not give anybody an objective that is rational reason to misinterpret one's actions and be deceived by them. But one does not have to enlighten people where no enlightenment is objectively required and one does not have to worry about their subjective irrational misinterpretations. In other words, do not fake reality, do not fake the evidence, do not fake your own person, and do not worry about or assume the responsibility for the judgment of others. If your behavior is objectively right, rational people will judge it correctly. As to irrational people, there is no way to prevent them from misinterpreting anything and no reason to care about them. Needless to say, you do not owe any honesty nor any other virtue or value to evil, to those who deal with you by force. When you are placed under the threat of physical violence, either by a criminal or a dictator, you do not owe him any truth. 
you do not sanction the double moral standard implied in any situation where a scoundrel counts on your virtue to serve his vice, where he demands that your good help him to commit his evil against you. If a hold-up man demands that you tell him where you have hidden your money, which he can't find, it is moral to lie. If the policemen of a dictatorship demand that you tell them the truth about your own convictions or your own actions, you have a moral right to lie your head off. You do not place your virtue, your honesty, in the service of their evil. When men are placed under force, under the threat of a gun, all morality is suspended in regard to the gunman. He has suspended it. And thereafter, the only moral principle his victims have to observe is their own self-interest. Anything they choose to do in self-defense is morally right. This does not mean that they suspend morality in regard to other innocent victims, of course, but only in regard to the dictator or the gunman who initiated the use of physical force. It's not, of course, a matter of subjective choice, error or whim, to decide whether a given situation permits you to, in a manner of speaking, suspend morality. There is an object of principle by which one judges. The principle is the question of whether you commit an immoral action in order to gain some value which you would not possess otherwise or in order to protect a value which you possess by right and which is threatened by force. That is, whether you act to gain a positive or to negate a negative. In this last case, your action is not immoral. For example, if someone breaks into your house to burglarize it, he's seeking to grow richer, to get something he didn't have before. If you exercise force to prevent his entry, you don't grow any richer. You really keep a value that's already rightfully yours. The moral difference involved is the difference, of course, between murder and self-defense. Now, turning finally in this discussion to another very basic principle of action virtue of the objectivist ethics, namely productiveness. In order to live, man must achieve the values his life requires. Man must think, then he must translate his thought into action. He must choose his goals, then he must proceed to achieve them. To accept the responsibility of achieving values, to accept responsibility for one's life, is to practice the virtue of productiveness. Just as it is not man's duty to spend his effort on supporting the existence of others, so it is not his right to exist as a parasite on the effort of others. Productiveness, quoting Galt, quote, is your acceptance of morality, your recognition of the fact that you choose to live, that productive work is the process by which man's consciousness controls his existence, a constant process of acquiring knowledge and shaping matter to fit one's purpose, of translating an idea into physical form, of remaking the earth in the image of one's values, close quote. Productiveness demands that you recognize that man is not a ghost, that thinking is not an end in itself, that the purpose of thought is action in physical reality, that man's life depends on the material expression and objectification of his knowledge and values. 
If man merely sits and thinks and dreams and projects goals and values and takes no action to bring any of it into reality, he will perish or else live off those who do practice the virtue on which he has defaulted. So long as man lives, he is surviving either by his own effort or by someone else's. On the desert island, the virtue of productiveness would not be open to debate. Men would practice it or they would cease to exist. The purpose of the morality of altruism, of the doctrine of self-sacrifice and service to others, is to make it possible for certain human beings living in society to practice that which would kill them if they tried it on the desert island. You are morally free to choose any form of work you wish, provided two conditions are fulfilled. That the activity you have chosen is rational, and that it demands the fullest use of your mind. The man who works very hard at selling phony stocks isn't practicing the virtue of productiveness and neither is the man who settles into a job he can perform while nine-tenths of his consciousness is out of focus. This doesn't mean, of course, that you are immoral if, on the way to your chosen goal, you are obliged to work at odd jobs requiring less than your full capacity. Then you use your mind outside of office hours if its uses are limited during work. But during work, you're not properly in an out-of-focus daze either. If it is a failure of productiveness to wish to work at less than one's capacity, it is equally a failure of productiveness and of morality to wish for a job that is beyond one's ability. This means that, for example, if you do not know how to run a haberdashery, do not aspire to be President of the United States. Do not allow the range of your action to exceed the range of your thought. Do not bluff your way into a job. Do not pretend skills you do not possess. Do not spend your life sneakily imitating motions you do not understand and frantically hoping that no one will find you out. Seek constantly to expand the range of your knowledge and of your competence, but in the meantime, if you do not know how to type, do not hire yourself out as a typist. If you do not know anything about business, do not try to earn your living in the stock market. If you have not yet decided whether or not you exist, do not undertake to teach classes in philosophy. <laughs> your work is the chief existential expression of your self-esteem because your work is properly the major focus of your thinking. To exist purposefully, which means to pursue rational values, is not only a practical necessity of your survival, it's a necessity of mental health, of self-confidence, of self-esteem. Self-esteem requires that you be in control of your existence and no control is possible to the man without a purpose. Do you remember the letter read to you by Mrs. Brandon in her lecture on efficient thinking? The letter written by a schizophrenic? You observed the total lack of logical connection or coherence in that letter, the associational rambling, the drifting from one unrelated subject to another. And it was pointed out to you that the cause of this was the inability of the schizophrenic to hold his mind to a purpose. It is a mental purpose that unifies and integrates one's thoughts and thus makes control over one's consciousness possible. Well, similarly, it is an action purpose, a goal to achieve in reality, 
that unifies and integrates one's actions and makes control over one's existence possible. The more long-range the goal, the greater the integration. Not to have long-range purposes is to be motivated by chance, by the feelings, the invitations, the phone calls of the moment. Life and happiness are the consequence of pursuing and achieving rational values, and your work is the means by which you achieve them. And because it is his work that maintains his life, it is his work that constitutes the basic source of man's happiness, the foundation of the other forms of happiness that he can hope to experience. It is his work that provides man with a sense of efficacy, of control over reality, without which no other enjoyment is possible. There is no one so incapable of achieving pleasure as the professional pleasure chaser. The man who imagines that he can have a celebration without having achieved anything to celebrate. The man who imagines that he can enjoy other values without having to achieve self-value. I want to conclude this discussion of productiveness with one final point. And that is that women are human beings too. They are not a different species. And everything said about the necessity of existing purposefully and creatively applies to them. It is as morally and psychologically improper for a woman to have no creative or productive goal, no career, as it would be for a man. A woman may decide for a few years to spend her time on the job of motherhood. This isn't a lifetime career. It's a short-term career at best. It's not her metaphysical duty to do so, not her moral duty, not her destiny. It's a choice of a career, a short-range one like any other. And if she chooses it, she has to bring to it the fullest rationality, the most conscientious intellectual discipline of which she is capable. She has to realize that enormous intellectual discipline, conscientiousness, thoughtfulness is required to train and educate children properly and to prepare them for adult life. She must not regard herself as a breeding machine whose fitness for motherhood is achieved solely by the possession of the appropriate biological apparatus. In this connection, there is a book which I want very enthusiastically to recommend to you, and that, of course, is Betty Friedan's The Feminine Mystique, because this is a superb analysis of the sociological and psychological disaster which has resulted from the notion that woman's destiny is in the kitchen and the nursery, and that careers are exclusively for men. She has a great deal very interesting to say about how this mystique has developed and what kind of tragedies it leads to. One of the most interesting facts in the book is that the highest incidence of nervous breakdowns, of neurotic collapses, of emotional disturbances among women is to be found in women who have gone through college and therefore presumably displayed some level of intelligence and who, after leaving college, decided to confine themselves exclusively to the role of wife and mother. The highest incidence of psychological breakdown occurs among women in this group. The fact that the culture sanctions a far greater degree of passivity in women than in men doesn't make it moral and doesn't make it psychologically healthy. 
<laughs> to be continued next week. Thank you.